I'm Eric Strong from Stanford University, and today I'll be talking about Ebola. This is obviously a huge topic in the news at the moment all around the world on account of the unprecedented current outbreak in West Africa. And while the outbreak has been limited to just a handful of cases outside of Africa, it nevertheless has created quite a bit of discussion here in the United States, and I suspect in other countries as well. Now, there is certainly a role for a healthy fear of a deadly infectious agent. However, what we've seen is not as much healthy fear as it is excessive anxiety bordering on panic. And when people start to panic about a public health threat, it encourages the media to feed into that panic by focusing just on the worst case scenario, by interviewing uninformed politicians who are completely unqualified to offer any opinion at all, and by giving a platform to kooks and conspiracy theorists. My goal with this video is to help bring us all back to reality with the known epidemiology and medical science about Ebola. Those of you who are familiar with my other medical videos know that they are uh, generally apolitical, uh, and as much as I might have to say about the politics and social psychology involved in this particular situation, I'm going to try to keep the rest of this video confined to the facts as much as possible. So uh, just because there is um, so much to talk about with Ebola, I've actually divided the topic into two separate videos. The first one is more of a general overview and historical perspective that will be geared more towards a uh, general audience. And the second video will cover more details about the transmission, the diagnosis, treatment, and infection control of Ebola, which will be aimed slightly more at healthcare professionals, though I think the general public will still find it interesting as well. By the end of this video, you should be able to list four common myths about Ebola. You should be able to describe the basic classification of the Ebola virus, to describe the history of Ebola outbreaks, including the current epidemic in West Africa, and to be able to describe the scope of the current epidemic compared to prior outbreaks, including predictions of future cases. First, what exactly is Ebola? As you probably know, Ebola is a virus, one that was first seen in Sudan in 1976. It occurs sporadically in unpredictable outbreaks, and in between outbreaks, it remains hidden in a non-human reservoir, which is strongly suspected to be bats. Ebola causes a form of viral hemorrhagic fever, one with an unusually high case fatality rate, which can range anywhere from 30 to 90 percent, depending upon the specific species of Ebola. If you've been listening to the media about Ebola, you probably have heard plenty of mischaracterizations and exaggerations about this illness. So let me point out a couple right away. First, although most media reports focus on the fatality rates of 80 to 90 percent, these rates are only seen with the most virulent of outbreaks. In addition, were an outbreak to occur in the West, it is highly probable that fatality rates would be much lower on account of much better accessibility to high-level care. Rates of 90% are seen in those communities with limited access to sterile equipment, limited supplies of intravenous fluid, and no ICU-level care available. The second and third mischaracterizations are a consequence of Ebola's categorization as a hemorrhagic fever virus. Not all patients with Ebola develop fever. During the current West Africa epidemic, only about 90% of confirmed cases have a fever. That obviously is an inconvenient fact for the CDC when they issue guidance on how to monitor Ebola contacts by checking their temperatures twice daily. That's not necessarily a bad recommendation, but that alone will not catch every new onset Ebola case. Monitoring for other symptoms such as chills, non-productive cough, chest or abdominal pain, and generalized muscle aches are all also critical. The third mischaracterization is that Ebola causes all patients to hemorrhage from every orifice. While Ebola can definitely cause a condition called disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC, which can lead to hemorrhaging from the nose, mouth, and GI tract, most patients with Ebola do not get this problem. In other words, most patients with Ebola are not vomiting blood or bleeding from their eyes. Now, excluding healthcare professionals and people from Central Africa, most others have probably not heard of Ebola prior to this summer. If they had, it was likely on account of two sources. 
The first was the 1994 bestseller The Hot Zone, which was a non-fiction thriller describing the origin of Ebola and a very similar virus called the Marburg virus. The main focus of the book is actually on a specific species of Ebola discovered among monkeys kept at a research facility in Reston, Virginia. The second source is the 1995 fictional film Outbreak. In Outbreak, Dustin Hoffman leads a team of researchers, first in Africa and later in the U.S., in identifying and containing a fictional virus called Motaba, which was clearly modeled on Ebola. I want to compare these two sources for just a moment because it will highlight another pervasive myth about Ebola. In The Hot Zone, author Richard Preston's writing plays up the thriller aspect of the disease in order to make the book more engaging, but the science and history remains accurate. In contrast, Outbreak, irrespective of some filmmaking missteps, made a major plot development dependent upon a scientifically implausible event. That this virus, previously transmitted only through body fluids, can through a simple single generation mutation become airborne. And while the majority of Americans may not have seen this movie, it nevertheless has impacted the belief that Ebola can likewise spontaneously mutate and become airborne. This has contributed to Ebola panic we are currently seeing. But to put things into perspective, no one worries about HIV or hepatitis C suddenly becoming airborne. Granted, those diseases are currently less contagious than Ebola, but that doesn't mean that Ebola has an easier time expanding its modes of transmission. At this point, I'd like to discuss Ebola's discovery and its history of outbreaks, but I think it will first be instructive to review the basics of how the Ebola virus is scientifically classified. Virologists use similar taxonomic nomenclature for viruses as we use for more conventional life forms. The Ebola virus is a member of the virus family Filoviridae, from the Latin filum, meaning thread-like. There are three genera in this family. The first is Marburg virus, of which there is one species, the somewhat confusingly named Marburg-Marburg virus, though everyone just refers to it as Marburg. This hemorrhagic fever virus was first discovered in 1967, when a small outbreak occurred in Germany and Yugoslavia, after a shipment of infected monkeys from Uganda. Since then, there have been two other notable outbreaks of several hundred people apiece, occurring in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Angola. Marburg virus leads to an illness clinically indistinguishable from Ebola, and one equally deadly. The next genus to be described is Ebola virus. There are five individual species. The overwhelming majority of outbreaks have been due to the first two, which emerged within several months of each other in the neighboring countries of Sudan and Zaire. As mentioned earlier, Reston Ebola virus was discovered among lab primates in Virginia and is the only Ebola species to be non-pathologic to humans. It is also the only Ebola species not endemic to Africa, as the source of the infected primates was the Philippines. It remains a mystery as to how Ebola Reston managed to show up in the Philippines with a nearly identical genome to viruses endemic only to Africa. Thai forest Ebola virus is known to have infected just a single individual in history, a scientist who was performing autopsies on chimpanzees in the Ivory Coast. Finally, the Bundy Bugyo virus emerged in Uganda in 2007 and has been responsible for two modest outbreaks. For the sake of completeness, the last genus in the filoviruses is Cueva virus, of which there is a single member, Yawview Cueva virus, which was discovered in bats in Spain in 2002, and as with Reston Ebola, it appears to be non-pathologic to humans. Focusing just on Ebola, I'll now review a history of Ebola outbreaks to help put the current West Africa epidemic into proper historical context. As mentioned, Ebola first emerged in Sudan in 1976, in a region now within the new nation of South Sudan. The index case, that is the very first person known to have been infected by Ebola, worked in a cotton factory in the town of Zara on the Sudan-Zaire border. He initially presented to a local health center with fever, headache, and chest pains. He developed a profusely bloody nose and bloody diarrhea the following day and died a week later. Two other employees at the cotton factory became ill within the next several weeks, and the outbreak developed from these three initial cases. 
Since the degree of infectivity and mortality risk were not appreciated during the first several months, infection among healthcare workers was a particularly severe problem. In one local hospital, over one-third of all employees developed Ebola. It remains unclear how the index case became infected, but since the three original cases were not close other than working in the same factory, one theory is that the source was an animal living within the building itself. Here's a couple pictures from the early days of Ebola. These workers already have personal protective equipment, so this was after they realized how dangerous it was. But also notice the conditions of the hospital. In the picture on the bottom, the patient on the rusty bed in an open ward appears to have just vomited Ebola-laden vomitus on himself and the concrete floor. Who knows what methods were used to clean him, the sheets, the beds, and the floor, without risking exposure to others. Now just a month or two after Ebola appeared in Sudan, it appeared in Zaire. Initially it was assumed to be all part of the same outbreak, and only later did virologists demonstrate that they were two separate outbreaks caused by two genetically distinct viruses subsequently named Sudan Ebola virus and Zaire Ebola virus. Here's a picture of the first international medical team in Africa to study Ebola, who initially thought they might actually be dealing with the newly described Marburg virus. This team was led in part by Dr. Peter Pio, just two years out of medical school, who would later become one of the world's leading AIDS researchers. It was around this time that the virus was determined to be something other than Marburg, and was then deliberately but somewhat arbitrarily named Ebola after the nearby Ebola River. After claiming the lives of several hundred people in Sudan and Zaire, the two simultaneous outbreaks died out. The following year, a single isolated case showed up elsewhere in Zaire, which amazingly did not trigger another outbreak. Then a small outbreak of 34 cases in Sudan in 1979. And then there was a long lull. 15 years went by without a single case until it showed up in Gabon, and then a single case of the previously known Thai forest species in the Ivory Coast. And then over the next 20 years, there were sporadic outbreaks throughout Central Africa. The one random case, or seemingly random case in South Africa, was in a nurse who was caring for an infected traveler from Gabon. Then in December 2013, the history of Ebola changed dramatically. A two-year-old boy in Guinea developed fever, abdominal pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. Within several days, he died, and shortly thereafter, his entire family became ill and died as well. In the tropics, this collection of symptoms could be due to any one of dozens of diseases, and aside from the one case of the Thai forest virus, Ebola had never before been seen in West Africa. Neither the people nor the doctors had any idea what they were dealing with. Although we'll never be certain from where the boy acquired Ebola, it was reported that his family consumed bushmeat for sustenance. Bushmeat is a staple for millions in Africa and consists of wild game caught in tropical forests, which unfortunately can harbor disease. Now, since the disease was not immediately recognized, it spread rapidly to the neighboring countries of Sierra Leone and Liberia, becoming the great 2014 epidemic we are currently seeing. Instead of having three separate modest circles, it's probably more accurate to represent the epidemic with one huge circle. This epidemic has since spread to Nigeria, who appears to have successfully stopped it after only just 20 cases. And there was also a single case in Senegal, which also appears to have been contained. And last, coincidentally, another outbreak developed in Democratic Republic of Congo in August, which appears to be unrelated to the main epidemic. So now that we've seen the history of epidemics on the map, let's look at a few statistics, again to help put the 2014 epidemic into context. Prior to this year, here are the 10 largest outbreaks of Ebola in history, the worst one being Uganda in 2000, which topped out at around 400 cases. If I then add the current epidemic, we'll need to change the scale just a bit. As of today, October the 21st, there have been approximately 10,000 reported cases of Ebola in West Africa. And this excludes the fact that it's widely believed the official numbers suffer from severe underreporting and that the true number of cases may be twice this or even more. What's even more frightening than the current numbers are predictions of future numbers, and those predictions are all over the place. Here is one prediction model 
the mathematics of which are complicated, but if you focus on the middle dark red line, that predicts that the number of active cases will top out at around 14,000 in about another two months before starting to decline on account of the declining population and that enough people in the population will then be carrying antibodies to the infection from exposure and survival. But here's another model which has two extremes shown. The prediction represented by the blue line is based on the ability to trace 100% of Ebola contacts and implementation of better infection control policies in hospitals, which could reduce nosocomial infections by 75%. The prediction represented by the gray line is if contact tracing and infection control does not improve, resulting in 200,000 total cases by the end of the year with no decline in sight. What I find to be highly concerning is both the possible magnitude of future cases and the range of uncertainty. There is a very real possibility that this could continue to grow into a truly catastrophic event that will shape the future of Africa to a similar magnitude of AIDS. That's the end of part one of this two-part series on Ebola. The next video will cover how the virus is transmitted to people, how it's diagnosed and its treatment, and a little bit about effective infection control measures to prevent spread within hospitals.